Okay, so we're streaming on the JFCS Facebook page as well for anyone that's tuning in there. Welcome. And to the rest of you, thanks so much for joining us today for this program. I have two special guests with me today. I have Sherry Hoban, who is the Executive Director of the Consumer Bankruptcy Assistance Project. And I have Jamie Baum. She is a law student at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's also a member of the Penn Law Financial Literacy Project. And they're here to bring you um, some really excellent information about budgeting, credit, and student loans. Um, so have your questions ready. They've asked that if you have questions, you can um, ask them right as you think of them. And I'll be monitoring the chat and also the Q&A section. And for those of you watching on Facebook, if you type your questions into the comment section of the video, um, we have uh, Deb Bornstein who's going to be feeding those questions into us so that I'll be able to ask them of our presenters. Um, so I don't want to take up too much more time. So Jamie and Sherry, if you guys are ready, we can get started. Yes. Well, thank you. We're excited to be here. Uh, I want to go ahead and share my screen with everyone so you can see our slides and we'll get going. So again, I'm Sherry Hoban, Executive Director of Consumer Bankruptcy Assistance Project. I'm here with JB, Jamie Baum. We are excited to present this information to you. You will see as we go through the information, we present it, we have a bunch of people on the call. I don't know all your, your ages, experiences, everything. We present it as if you're young adults, uh, but really it's just good financial information and ways to make sure you are fully knowledgeable about how you're managing your day-to-day -day personal finances. So that's the goal, right? Reaching a, a level of financial independence, financial empowerment that you're comfortable with and that you can take, take control of your money. So we talk about this path to financial independence, the same as sort of any journey uh, you're starting from point A, we're going to point B, where do you want to be? What is your financial goal? That's what we're here to talk about, how you're going to get there, um, defining what your goal may be. Maybe you're listening to us today just because you want general good best practices. Maybe you are heading off to college soon and you want to start saving money. Maybe you're just leaving college, you're, you're working, and you're trying to figure out the best way to maximize your money. We'll kind of cover all of our bases. Um, and where we are going to start is basic budgeting. It's the foundation of good financial practices. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to turn it over to Jamie and let her get into the details of budgeting. OK, great. Thank you, Sherry. Um, so budgeting basically has this idea that you have money coming in and you have money going out. And so how do you manage that money so that you get to a place that you're secure with your finances? So the terms we use to talk about our money is income and expenses. So income talks about all the money that's coming into your bank account or into your pool of money that you have. And expenses are what you spend that money on. Um, and so, Sherry, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll break it down into a few more categories just so people can get some tangible ideas. So where could your money come from, right? We said it could come from your salary, from your job. It could come from other things you do to raise money for yourself, whether it's babysitting, whether it's um, selling something to people, if you get an allowance, if you get money as gifts, all of that is coming into your pool of money. And we're going to call that income, OK? Um, expenses are what you spend your money on, and that means you have a choice of what you buy, right? So you, generally, people will spend their money on things that they want and things that they need. And also, you want to plan for things that you might need in the future. So if you have an expense, right, if you have something you spend your money on all the time, you can expect that on the first of every month, you're going to have to pay that bill. And so you need to think about how will you have enough money coming in to pay for those things that occur um, more of the time, things that you can expect to pay in the future. Um, 
And so managing that or keeping track of, I spend this much money on food every week, I should probably save this much money because I'm gonna need food next week. Or I spend this much money on rent every month, so I'm gonna need this much money for rent. And so if you have, um, let's say $100 coming in every week and you spend 20 on food and you spend 10 on hanging out with people, like getting coffee, then you know that $30 of your $100 is going to be spent, leaving you with $70 left over. And so you can adjust those numbers based on how much you want left over and how much you want to spend. And so um, the leftovers is what we call savings. And the spends, the things that you're spending are called expenses. Um, was that too fast? Does anybody have any questions? We're good. Okay. I don't see um, any questions yet. So keeping track of all of this could seem daunting, especially if you're buying a lot of things throughout your week or you're getting a lot of money from different places. So I just want to let you know that there are apps that you can use. You always want to make sure that your apps are a trusted um, monetary platform, but two of the recommended apps out there are called Pocket Guard and Mint. And so those can connect to your bank accounts or to your financial instruments and keep track for you and give you a little summary saying you actually spent this much money in these categories like gas, um, coffee, food, supermarket shopping, clothing. And so you can actually see how much you're spending and decide how to adjust it so that you can get to the financial goal that you want. So again, those apps are Pocket Guard and Mint, and then there are others and you feel free to Google them, but always make sure that it's a trusted service. I um, use Mint personally, so I'm just gonna pipe in real quick. Jamie, just to let you know, you know, just, just to you know, verify that it is one of the trusted ones. I use it personally, um, I think it's great, and it helps me you know, practice what I preach here um, with my basic budgeting. And it even caught a fraudulent charge once before my bank did. So they're, they're good, they're useful, they're useful tools. Excellent. Um, and so we were talking about things that we spend our money on, and we talked about needs and wants. So you need to eat, but you might want to eat something that's more extravagant, right? Like a five course meal, but you don't have a five course meal every time you eat lunch. And so thinking about what your wants are and how to plan for those larger expenses versus what you need and making those less expensive so that when you want to spend more money, you have it. Um, so that comes down to like, what do I need to spend money on? Definitely need to eat, but deciding how you spend that money goes with managing your wants and being aware that um, everything comes with a cost and paying attention to how much things cost so that you can plan for them. Um, so you can have your wants and you can have your needs, but you should be mindful that you're not only going for the wants and that you're still satisfying the things that you need. Yeah. Great. Um, so like we said, in order to have a budget, you should be keeping track of where your money goes because otherwise it's $5 here, $5 there. This is only $8, but it's on sale from $20. So that sounds like a good deal. But before you know it, your whole total is over $100. And so writing things down and keeping track of how much money you have coming in and how much you have going out can help you stay mindful and keep in line with that budget. Um, and so just to break it down further, income is the, th is the money that you're adding to your pool of money. So that makes the numbers go up. Expenses is what's the money that's leaving. So that's being subtracted from your total and that makes the total go down. So income goes up, expenses makes your money go down. Okay, so in general, you probably wanna have a higher income than your expenses. This way you always are in the positive numbers. If your expenses are a higher number than your income, then you're gonna end up owing money and that's called debt. So as long as you have more money coming in and less money going out, you're gonna be in the clear and you'll have money for yourself left over, um, which we said before is called savings or just your account, um, as opposed to um, having more money going out. So if I only have $50, but my bill is $100, then I don't have enough to pay that bill. Um, and so that's the problem. And so you want your income to be higher than your expenses. Okay. Um, again, increasing your income, decreasing your expenses. So say that you want 
to make sure that you have money, that you're financially stable. And so your salary is one number, but you know that your bills are a higher number, then you're gonna try to increase your income. That means find more ways to have more money coming in. But another way to fix that problem is to also lower your expenses. So if you're spending high numbers of money, maybe that means you need to switch from your wants to your needs and find lower expenses that can still satisfy those needs. Okay, so this little chart over here talks about the average weekly earnings. Um, and then that's based on salaries and education. So I think- Yeah, I I'll pipe in here for a second, Jamie, just because you know we, we keep this slide in and Jamie and I talked about this before. Um, you know, One of the pieces of, of advice that still gets thrown around is to increase your income, you're going to need more education. And with the student loan landscape, and we're gonna talk about student loans at the end in detail and ways to maximize that. But this is one that I like putting in here because I don't think this is actually as true as it once was. I don't think that it's an automatic that if you get more education, that you're going to increase your income. There are a lot of nuances, a lot of caveats to that blanket statement. But I, I put this out there because I think this advice is still thrown around. So it's sort of my, okay, you're gonna hear this. Uh, so let's talk about it and figure out ways that it's true or the times that it's not true. Or if you are thinking of going back to school or getting a degree, what are the ways you can do that so that this does become true for you? So we're gonna talk about that today. Um, and okay, yeah, we have we have a little bit more about it later when we talk when we get into the details about student loans. But that's where I wanna um, focus on here is that there are ways that going back to school and getting more education is going to increase your income in the long term, but there are ways to be smart about it so you maximize your money. And I'm actually going to pause. I think we're going to talk about that more when we get into student loans, um, but I just want to flag it now because I know this advice is out there. I know someone is going to tell it to you, uh, so we'll, we'll get into the weeds about it in a little bit, uh, including specific websites that you can look to see if your specific field or area that you're thinking of going into is hiring right now and how much school will you need. Um, so like I said, uh, we'll get into the weeds here, but that is one way that you're always going to hear that advice about increasing your income is do you have to go back to school? So I know probably other people are thinking about it. So we'll, we'll you know, hopefully get an answer to you for your specific situation by the end of this presentation. Um, and then, Jamie, is there anything else you want to add about budgeting before we start getting into borrowing? Um, yeah, I think I just want to remind everybody that when you have your finances, it's important to have a plan. So you want to think about what do you eventually want to spend your money on and what do you want to spend your money on now? And we've talked about this before about having that financial map and paying attention to what um, your current expenses and your future expenses are going to be when managing this pool of money. And so um, I think that's that's the first goal. And so making sure that you have an income means like you have a steady flow of cash coming in and then your expenses are what's leaving from your pocket. So just paying attention to how much is leaving and why and then being mindful of that is just really important. Yeah, the paying attention is the, is the big key. You'd be amazed at how many people don't always realize what's going out of, of their bank accounts or even just how much. You know, you have an idea in your head of how much you're spending on gas every month. Uh, but anyone that owns a car right now knows we're all spending a little bit more on gas right now. You know, did you track that? Did you re-update your budget? Um, to, or do you still have that old number in your head? And then when you sit down and do the math, just like Jamie said, you know, do you need to do uh, some tweaking to your budget to make sure you still have more income than expenses um, so that you are in the black, as they say, um, in your, your accounting books. But 
right? We know that that's the dream, right? We know, yes, I, that's the goal to have more income than our expenses. But there are going to be times when we might need to borrow money. And there are ways to do it that are smart and cautious and careful and informed. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So one of the most obvious ways that we borrow money is from credit cards. And credit cards can be really helpful. They can be really convenient, uh, but they can be really easy to get us into debt. Okay, and that's why we say borrowing can be really helpful or it can be a detour, right? We don't want to get to a place where that borrowing money is getting us into trouble, is getting us too much debt and too much debt that we can't pay off. Okay, so that's why we say we proceed with caution during this. This is our proceed with caution uh, portion of, of the talk. Okay, <clears throat> but credit cards. That's the way we're gonna borrow money most likely, especially if we are um, a little bit younger, maybe you aren't buying a car yet, you're not buying a home yet, uh, but you are working, you do have a credit card, you have your own bank accounts. So let's start there, credit cards. Remember, when you use your credit card, you are borrowing money. And I think that's the concept people sometimes forget that when you're using your credit card, you're actually borrowing money. You are, that's, you're going into debt, that little piece. Even if you're just using your credit card for your cup of coffee, uh, you know, you are going into debt. Debit cards are different. Remember, debit cards are attached to your checking account. So then you're using your own money. Credit cards, you're using sort of a bank's money uh, that you eventually have to pay back. So that's one way to think of credit cards to keep yourself in check is that every time you use it, you're borrowing money, okay? Now, there are, again, good things and bad things about that. That's just one way to keep you in check. How do we use our credit cards in the smartest way possible? Same with our budget. And we talk about being aware and really conscious of what's going in and out of your bank account. Credit's the same way. That's actually the bottom line. You're going to hear us probably say it several times during this whole, this whole hour. Being aware is probably the most important part. And it's amazing. Um, you, I know you're all listening to that and saying, of course, but because we use money just so easily every day, um, sometimes it's so easy just to, to not keep track of every little penny. And so this is how we, we're going to try to keep you as on top of it as we can. So for credit cards specifically, how do we do it in the most informed way? The first is to know what you're signing. When you sign and sign up for a new credit card, you are signing an agreement. You are agreeing to their terms and conditions. And the big things that, there are three big things that are gonna come up and when you sign a credit agreement or when you sign up for a new credit card. The first is your credit limit. That's the total amount that the credit card is gonna allow you to spend. The second is fees, and we're gonna talk about that and how many different fees there are and how much interest you're gonna pay when you borrow. Now, for every credit card, your credit limit is actually individual. That's gonna be based on your information, your credit history, your credit uh, score, which we'll talk about, and a lot of times your income. They'll take that and they're gonna assign you personally at your credit limit. But the fees and the interest tend to go with the card. So if you have a Chase Sapphire card, I think that's one of the commercials you see, Chase Sapphire. Um, that will, you're normally gonna have, everyone that has that card is gonna have a similar fees and interest, but your credit limit is gonna be your own. But those are the three things to really know uh, before you sign up for a card, okay? Get, don't agree to anything you don't fully understand. So what types of fees are there? There is a lot. Uh, and most importantly, all of these fees are not the same between credit cards. So that's something you wanna look at, something you wanna compare. Not all credit cards have an annual fee, but many do. Most will have a late fee, but the amount of the late fee will be different. Uh, if, you, if you go over your limit, 
The balance check is, is for, for debit cards. Again, that's attached to your checking account. So if you use your debit card and you go over, what kind of fee are you gonna be charged? Um, do you just get denied or do you go into um, a different account? Balance transfer, a lot of people try to play the game a little bit and move their debt from one credit card to another Maybe because some cards have like no interest for the first year and then it sort of skyrockets. So there are some people that try to play the game and they switch their credit cards to try to keep that no, that no fee. And there are pros and cons to that, as you can imagine. Cash advance, are you able to actually get cash from your credit card? If you do, what kind of deductions, what kind of fees? These are all questions to ask all things to know before you sign up for a credit card. Actually, before I get into interest, I am going to show you exactly what I mean. Let's see if I can switch my screen here. And, oops, sorry folks. My Zoom is uh, blocking the website I want. This is it. Okay. So you can go to nerdwallet.com and I think we can put this uh, website into the um, chat and you can actually compare credit cards. Credit card compare. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Oh, hold on. See? Uh, so, right, some have rewards, zero interest. You can see already that uh, how many options there are in your credit card, okay? Um, we're going to compare a Chase Freedom and a Discover, okay? Compare cards. Can we see this? Can I get a nod from Jamie or Laura if you guys can see this? Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. So Discover, Chase Sapphire, Chase Freedom. So let's look. Annual fee, right? We just talked about fee. Notice how two do not have annual fee and one has $95. So if you weren't aware, all of a sudden in December, you would have gotten this $95 charge and not realized what was what it was or why you were getting charged. Um, these cards all have rewards. A lot of credit cards have rewards. Make sure if you're if you're choosing a credit card based on rewards, make sure they're relevant to you. Some have cash back, always helpful. Some have airline miles. Uh, mine does. My parents uh, retired. They live in Florida now. So having a card with airline miles helps me. That might not help other people. I know my coworker loves Banana Republic. She has like a Banana Republic credit card. Um, I don't shop there as much. That wouldn't, that wouldn't help me. So if you're going to get rewards, make sure they're relevant, they're useful uh, to you. APR, annual percentage rate. That's the interest, okay? When we say APR, that means interest. So you can see the difference here. 15 14 or 11, right? And then they, they have maximums too for the different interest. Um, cash advance, we, we talked about how there's a fee. Some credit cards let you take out fan, uh, uh, cash advance, but this is gonna charge you almost 25%. That's a lot, you know, that might not be worth it. So again, you can compare and contrast credit cards. The bottom line, they are not all the same and you wanna make sure you know what you're looking at. You wanna do your research uh, before you sign up for a credit card. The other story I tell is my cousin, when she first got her credit card, it was when she was going to college, it was like orientation. They had, the credit card companies had booths out um, trying to get people to sign up for their credit card. And she went to the one that was giving out candy. That's how she decided on her credit card was to go to the booth that was giving away candy. So what I want from all the participants listening here is to not be the person that signs a credit card just because they're giving away candy, okay? I want you to be doing your research and knowing what you're signing um, 
and not just looking for a Snickers bar. Okay. So we're going to go back to our slides and talk more about interest. So we talked about fees. We talked about rewards, that they're different. The commonality, right, is all credit cards, all loans are going to charge interest over time. The good news is it's avoidable. You can actually avoid paying interest if you pay your card in full every month. So you charge $100 on your credit card, your bill comes up, you pay $100, that's it. The bad news is, is that if you don't pay every month, that interest goes up, maybe the next month you pay it, it goes back down, then you start fluctuating and then it starts getting a little bit less predictable. Okay, let's talk about minimum payments. So here you can see, let's say you bought something, you bought a laptop for $500. You had the money, you paid it off the next month, you paid $500. You didn't have $500, so that's why we're using your credit card. Again, you're borrowing that money, you're going into a little bit of debt. It's gonna take you six months to pay. You know that you're gonna get some interest, but you have a plan, because remember we talked about planning, and you know you're gonna pay off in six months. So you did pay some interest, but you paid about 14 extra dollars. Okay, that's reasonable, that's manageable. Let's say you didn't really have a plan, you just threw it on your credit card and said, I'll deal with it later. You paid the minimum amount, but not a full amount. Three years later, you're still paying off for that laptop. And now you paid over 100, 150 extra dollars that could have been avoided, right? Now, Again, using that, knowing that you can be smart. For example, I know both my son's birthdays in October, my husband's birthday is November, my anniversary is in November, then it's the holidays. I spend a little bit more during October, November, December, every single year. It just happens. So come January, I don't always pay that off in one single lump sum. So I always know every January, I decrease, I stop my spending. I said, okay, everyone has their gifts. Everyone has their good stuff. You have enough clothes, we're good. So I, I minimize my spending in January so that I can afford to you know, pay off some of the last few months. And then by February, March, I'm good, I've paid off. But I know that, I go into it knowing it and uh, I, I account for some of that interest that's gonna build up and I still get it paid off. Now, I have a little practical tip here too, as far as payments and fees. Let's get into fees actually first, okay? Before I give you my little tip. Because the bottom line is, this is how the credit card companies make money, right? By all of those fees that add up, by that interest that doesn't get paid right away, that's how they make their, their money. That's how they made $90 billion in fees. And um, this was one of the recent years, 2018, um, right? And about 65 billion with the B in interest, okay? This is how they make money. And what I'm trying to get you to do is to keep that money with you as much as possible. You earned it. Let's empower your, your finances instead of the bank's finances. They'll be okay. They'll be okay, okay? So one of the ways to do that, this is my little trick, for your credit card, you have a credit card, you know you want to stay on top of everything, um, you know you don't wanna uh, pay anything late because we're gonna get into credit report. I actually have it set, my credit card set, where I pay the minimum automatically. That automatically gets taken out. Because the minimum, I know I'm always going to have that in my account. I always know I'm going to have the minimum. But by setting that up automatically, I'm never late. I never get billed that late fee that we talked about. Then once I that goes through and I see, oh, they took out my, my minimum, then I go back in and I make sure and I pay off the rest or I pay off as much as I can um, to avoid the interest. So what's one way to avoid late fees is to set up an automatic but sometimes you don't always want to set up your automatic to pay the full bill because maybe that was the month that you had 18 birthdays in one month like I do. 
and you um, don't want to pay off in full, or, or that was the month you bought your computer and you don't want to pay it off. If you set your automatic for maybe the minimum, that at least prevents you from the late fee. So why does it matter? Why does it matter if you have a late fee, if you're going into all this debt, who cares? This is what we're gonna talk about. Your credit history and credit reports. I like to call them your adult report cards because this is what people are going to look at when you want to do things like buy a house and a car or rent an apartment, anything like that. It's your credit report that they're looking at, your credit history. So what goes into that? Why does it matter? These are the three companies that um, obtain all of your credit information and that will give you your credit score. There are sometimes across the three, your credit score might be slightly different amongst the three, but they're gonna be pretty close. Um, and sometimes you can get them grouped all together. If you do like an annualcreditreport.com, um, I can say that slower actually so you get it, annualcreditreport.com. You can, you can check your credit score and that'll gather all three of these and get you a number. So what goes into it? <clears throat> credit score. Again, your adult report card. What they're checking when you have a credit score is your payment history. And that means, how, do you pay your bills on time? Your amount owed. So that is right. Have you gone into uh, a lot of debt? Are you are you keeping your balance low? You're not going into a ton of debt. Um, are you hitting your maximums? Or are you keeping your balance low? The other is length of history. Uh, do you have are all your accounts new? Have you had one credit card for a really long time, several years, and you've built that up and you've used it and you've maintained it? Um, new credit, are you opening a lot of new credit cards and using those? And do you have a credit mix? Meaning, do you have one credit card and that's it, one bank account? Or do you have, um, maybe you have a Target card and a credit card and your bank account. Uh, are you paying your utilities? Sometimes utilities go into your credit report. Um, are you paying off different things? Basically showing, are you able to maintain a few different accounts and still be, still be paying them off and still be, still be okay there? The biggest though, are payment history and amount owed. You can see together, right? They make up 65% of your score. Those are the big things. A late payment is going to show up. So that's usually more than 30 days late. Or you'll get a reminder, um, some credit cards will do if it's 90 days late, but most of the time it's if you're more than 30 days late with your payment history, with your, with your payment. That's why I talked about using your automatic, right? Signing it up and that way you're never late. You at least have paid that little bit and you don't get dinged because your payment history on your credit report stays on for seven years. So you paid late, uh, last month, that's going to stay on for seven years uh, and bring your score down just a little bit for that entire seven years. And then that sort of falls off and all of the recent information is there. Uh, and then again, the, the other biggest is your amount owed. If you're spending a lot and you're not paying it off and there's a big chunk out there, that's going to bring your credit score down. Okay, bring it down. Pain late carrying a balance too close to your limit, the things that are gonna bring it up, paying on time and keeping your balance low. Now, before I get into who uses your credit report, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about payment history, especially if we have younger folks listening, because sometimes you just don't have enough credit to have a credit score. That happened to me, I think my very first apartment uh, while I was still in college, I didn't have a ton of credit. Um, I think my parents had to sign for something because I didn't have enough credit of my own. So um, using your credit cards, right? I, I say all of this, not to scare you away from using credit cards, but just to be smart. If you're going to open a credit card in your name, uh, you can start using it and paying it off and building your credit. That will start to build and to show. Um, I wouldn't want necessarily 
for you to be like, that's scary. I don't want to use it. There are some benefits to using it. Just be smart about it. I see some, uh, Laura, I see some Q&A in the chat. Should we stop for a minute before I get yeah, into Yeah, I was actually waiting for a moment to jump in. We did have a question come in. <clears throat> Moshe's wondering, after being in credit debt for 40 years, I was able to pay off all my cards in 2015. Now, as soon as my charges come off of pending, I go online and pay the charge before the due date. Is this a good idea? That's great. That's great. If you're paying before the due date, that's even better. Wonderful. The bottom line is you're paying before the interest is adding up. So whether you pay before it's due or you pay before the following month, you're good because either way, you're paying before that interest is added. So yep, well done and congratulations for paying off your debt. That's a great feeling. Sherry, I also just wanted to um, jump in here for a second. So as Sherry was saying, your credit score is actually going to follow you for when you want to buy certain things. So like when she wanted to rent an apartment, they wanted to see her credit score, but she didn't really have one because she hadn't been using credit cards. So sometimes if you have the money, you still might want to use a credit card to buy something and then just pay that credit card with the money you have. So this way you build your credit score because it's still important that you have that record so that when you want to use money for the things listed on this slide, you have that record um, there. So that's just another element to why you might want to have a credit card. Great point, Jamie. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, Laura? Or am I good to go? You're good to go. All right, all right, great. So um, who looks at this? Who looks at your credit report? Other lenders, right? So if you're opening a new credit card or again, you're buying a house, a car, or you let's say you're trying to start a, a business and you're getting a business loan, other lenders are going to look at your credit score. Some employers, especially if you're dealing with money for them, but most specifically, landlords almost always run a credit check on you. They want to make sure, right, your adult credit card is look, or your, not your adult credit card, your adult report card is looking good before they rent you an apartment. Uh, utility companies, communications, meaning your cell phone, right, um, or cable, anything like that, uh, they'll check, they'll do a, a credit check before they give you the service. And then sometimes insurance companies will also. Um, so that is who is looking, who can look at your credit score and why you want it to be um, hopefully, you know, as high as you can. So consequences of bad credit, right? What happens? You have let it go. Um, you haven't paid on time or you've only been paying the minimums. Things are adding up. So what happens? Again, one is a lower credit score. But with that lower credit score, let's say you are taking a loan, you're buying a new car. It's not necessarily that you won't get the car just because you have a bad credit card, but now you're higher risk. They're saying, uh oh, their adult report card is showing me something and some red flags. So I'm going to increase the interest. And that's a way for the bank or the lender to sort of protect themselves. So sometimes that lower credit score means higher interest rates when you go to try to take a loan out for something else. Uh, there are some credit cards that will only let you, or only approve you if you have a higher credit score. So if you try to get a new credit card, you might get denied because of your credit score. Um, some payments might get redirected. Sometimes the banks kind of sell off the loans to other lenders and you might end up with more fees uh, and then the last resort is you might have to file for bankruptcy. So sometimes you hear bankruptcy and people are getting really nervous and, and scared of it. There are times when bankruptcy can really give you a, a fresh start. Uh, there are people who haven't built that savings, don't have that safety net. If something happens, um, a loss of job, an illness, and they end up going into debt to, to pay off their debts. Um, and then a bankruptcy can kind of help clear that debt. The reason some people are so scared of it is it, it does stay on your credit card, your credit report for um, either seven to 10 years, depending on what type of bankruptcy you file. So that's a long time. You have this 
you know, bankruptcy was filed on your credit score. So again, all those people that are able to pull that report would see that. So that's why sometimes uh, people try to avoid it. They try to set up plans to pay off the debt so they don't have to file bankruptcy. Uh, so there are times when it can be really helpful, but most of the time people try to use it as a, as a lap, last resort because it does stay on your credit report for so long. Do we have another question? It looks like it popped up. Yeah, Sherry. Um, someone's wondering, what about personal loans? Why would they deny you for a personal loan? So, uh, because it be, so I'm assuming you're getting at if you're if you're trying to take out a loan like from the bank, um, there could be a few reasons. So, if your credit score is low, that would be one. They're saying you're too much of a risk for us to loan you money if your credit card is too low. Again, they might if, for a personal loan, they might not deny you. They might just increase your um, your interest rate. And that could be one. It would be more where you would get denied is a credit card. There would be a credit card that says, you know, we don't want you to use our credit card. Uh, you're too much of a risk if your credit score is too low. Um, so yeah, so those would be kind of the two consequences. You might not for a personal loan be denied. That might be a case where you would end up with a higher interest rate. And Laura, I'm seeing some in the chat too. Should I open up this chat and make sure you're monitoring that as well? Um, I don't see any other. Oh, I guess there was kind of a question. Um, if you stop using a credit card, would the company cancel it? Uh, that, you know, again, that would go back to knowing the terms and conditions. Some, if you don't use it for X amount of years, uh, and that would change depending on the credit card, they might. Some, if you have a zero balance for X amount of time, they'll close it but that will actually depend on the card itself. So that's something. Others will just keep it open forever and help you go back to it and it'll just kind of hang out. Um, but that would be specific to the card. Okay. All right, so I wanna make sure we still have to, I'm checking my time here. All right, perfect. Um, do we have any other questions about credit cards and credit scores before we move on to student loans? I'm not seeing too, too much oh, pop up. I'm there's one more question that popped sure. in. Um, say you have a credit card for a store and the store closes, yep. and would that then close your credit card to the store? And then how would that affect your credit score? Sure, sure. That's a great question, actually, because I think that's happening to a few stores now. So um, <clears throat> this is an opportunity where you might actually be able to be proactive. Um, I imagine it would eventually close, but you're able to call these credit re reporting agencies and close an account. So you could call, if you're still seeing it hang out, saying this, the store is closed and this account is still on my credit report, you can actually call uh, the credit reporting agency and, and ask that they close it or try to figure out, um, let's say if it was a store card and it was up, there's normally a customer service or something on the back of the card you can actively close that account um, so that it's not just hanging out. How that would impact your credit score. One is the mix. Remember that it was like a little 10% if we went back to that pie chart, your credit mix. So if you're canceling a card and now instead of three cards, you only have two, that goes into your credit mix a little bit. Again, that's only 10%. That's not your biggest area. That's rarely a reason to, to just keep something open forever um, because even if it brings it down, it, it normally is temporary. So that would be one, the credit mix. Um, but yeah, that would be one I would say, I would advocate and, and suggest being proactive. And if it doesn't automatically close, that you take the steps to, to close it because there's no reason, especially if a store is closed, um, there's just sort of potential there. You don't want, you know, if you ever got your identity stolen or something, you wouldn't want people to use that for, for no reason. So I would take actions and I would actually just call and, and try to get it closed if you, if you don't see that it was automatic. Anything else? 
I don't see any other questions right now. Okay. So again, two types of borrowing, right? Some can get you in trouble. Some can increase uh, your score and really keep you on the path to independence in ways to even build that independence. So now we're going to talk about student loan, right? Keyword being loan, it's still a loan, but this is a very distinct type of loan, one that many, many, many of us have to enter into. And again, there's ways to do it to be smart. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jamie to finish us, finish us up here. Thank you, Sherry. Um, so we were talking about credit. Credit is borrowing money that you're going to pay back and you generally will pay credit back soon. So you'll pay it back on a monthly rotation. Some credit cards are different, but in general, you expect to have the money soon and pay it back in small increments. College student loans are a higher level of debt. It's generally a large amount of money to help you cover tuition. And that can be great because it moves you forward really quickly. But if you're not careful, it could deter you from your long-term financial goals. So we're gonna talk a little bit about why people might take student loans or how you could minimize how much you take of a student loan. So this slide over here shows you how much it costs to go to a degree program based on the type of degree you want. So this is these numbers are based on 2016. And so in 2016, the basic cost of a two-year degree from a public school, when we're just talking about tuition, fees, room, and food, not books or plans like that, just like your general, what you would need to go to school, that's about $3,500 or $3,500. For a four-year degree, it was about 9,500 a year, which can jump then to $20,000 per year when you add room and board. Okay, so these are the averages. Um, some cost less, some cost a little bit more. Um, but in general, now that we're, you know, 2021, it's a little bit higher. Um, anything to add, Sharon? No, good. Just that. Again, the advice has changed over the years, right? When I was coming up, it was sort of, you know, take out loans, go to the best school you can get into, you know, pay off later. With the student loan environment that we are in now, that's not the same advice that's given. Um, now it's more be smart about where you choose, look into... Um, you know, maybe start at a, um, in getting your associates and then transfer, right? So maybe pay for this for two years and then transfer to the private school. Um, maybe stay somewhere, go to the in-state school to get that lower tuition, especially, you know, think about where you're going to be after school. Do those in-state schools have a really great reputation locally? Then you know that use that reputation in that way. <clears throat> um, I don't think that the old advice of just like get in the best and you can figure it out later is as practical and realistic in 2021 as it was 15. Really, since the Great Recession, since 2010, 2009. I think after that really hit this advice change. So I think people are really smart about looking at the different uh, price tags of schools these days before they make their final decision. Yeah, and I know somebody asked if student loans go away. We're gonna talk about different types of student loans, but I think that the first thing to realize is that you're borrowing money and you're borrowing a lot of money and to pay that money back is gonna come with a cost. And so sometimes that cost is interest. Sometimes interest doesn't start till you finish your program. That'll really depend on what type of student loan you have. But first, you should just be mindful. Can you really minimize how much money you're taking? And so that's what our next slide is going to talk about. What are ways to afford um, an education from a college that can limit how much you're really borrowing and help you afford this opportunity? And so first, you should just do a Google search, like look up what are ways to minimize costs and see like 
do you have other things in your life that can limit your expenses? So we talked before about rent, right? So would you be paying for where you're living or can you live at home, live with a friend, split that cost um, rather than take it all on for yourself? Um, is the major that you're choosing gonna get you the best opportunities from this higher price school or is there a lower price school with the same major that would still be beneficial for you in that industry? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to look up what jobs give you certain returns. But just thinking about at the initial set, how much is school really gonna cost you? How much will this college education cost? And can you minimize those expenses like we talked about before? Um, and so that can come from all those different avenues, whether you're spending on wants versus needs versus splitting costs with people. And so that's the first step. Now that you have your bill, right? Like how much this is really gonna cost you, um, do you have savings that you can use to then minimize that cost a little bit more? So that's the second step on this slide. Like maybe work before getting that second degree, save some money, and then you can use that instead of borrowing. Um, third, we can talk about grants and scholarships. Grants and scholarships are different than loans because you don't pay those back. Those are someone's investment in you. Um, and so, those are that's money that's better that just minimizes your full bill at the end of school and then loans are there to then bridge that gap so now that you've minimized the cost that you have some money of your own to put towards this and you've gotten some help from the grants and the scholarships how much money do you still need to afford this degree and that's where student loans come in but the advice today is that really those loans should be your last resort Jamie, I'm just going to interrupt. We have another question about um, student loans going away. What if the school closes and what if it's a trade school? Oh, I'll take that one, Jamie. So that is a, that's a really great question. And the answer to that question has recently changed, which is why I'm pausing. So I believe there has been a lot of actually lawsuits going around about some of those schools the, the for-profit schools that closed down. And a lot of people took out loans to go to these schools and then these, these schools closed. Um, so now there is, I believe, a way to discharge that debt. There are, there, the lawsuits are pretty recent, but I believe under the Biden administration, that was one of the groups that he has um, eliminated some of that debt. So that is actually a um, very relevant question. And I'm going to make sure. I think right now, if the school closes, especially those for-profit schools, you can get that, that debt discharged. Um, the ways to do that, because it's so new, that I'm not as positive. Like if it's not happening automatically, if you haven't already gotten that letter saying your school is closed, um, you know, your debts are paid off, you know, how do you follow up with that besides calling the Department of Education and asking or whoever your loan servicer is, that would probably be the best way. Call the loan servicer and say, you know, I know these rules are changing. This, my school is closed. I believe I fall into the category. I should be able to get my loans um, forgiven. That's the word, forgiven uh, and, see, and see what they say. Uh, but I could do a little bit and I can maybe eat, follow up um, with an email if, uh, you know, send it to Deborah or Laura later and get some more information. But that is a very new, new rule that uh, before that I would have said, I mean, honestly, a month ago, I would have said uh, no, that they, they didn't go away. It's been very recent that they just changed that rule. So um, I can follow up. I can do a little bit more and see where the status of that is and see if I can get back to the group. Yeah, I was um, going to say, if anyone thinks of questions later on, feel free to use my email address and send them to me, and I'm happy to pass along your questions. I'll try to get an answer after the fact. I think we have one more comment. Yeah, I'm reading this question now, so I'll, I'll throw this one out. Um, uh, Synovia says, if the phone calls and letters have stopped coming, does that mean, are you good? Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Hopefully, hopefully it means it's good. Hopefully that means you're all good. It depends what the letter said. It depends what the last letter said. Um, 
If the last letter you got was like, this is a final notice, then no, that's not good, right? If, if the last letter, so that the phone calls, it's a good sign. It is definitely a good sign. I would still be proactive and, and double check. Uh, call the loan servicer, you know, find that last letter, see if there's a number somewhere that you can call and say, I, I've stopped receiving this. I think I'm, I'm, I'm forgiven. I want to uh, confirm that that's true. So yes, it is a good sign. Um, and so the answer is probably, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't just um, sit back. I wouldn't wait and see in that case. I would actually proactively call and, and double check and make sure that that's true. Okay, yeah. so we talked about minimizing your expense of college so that the amount of loans you take are smaller. Um, and so the reason for this is because loans are not free money that this entity is giving you. Because remember, student loans can come from different places. They don't all come from the government. But the fact is that it's not free money. Nobody's out there saying, here, take my money, right? They want something back. They want you to pay them back. And so you should really look to see what do you need student loans for, and then use that money for what you need it for. That means absolute necessities that you can't afford on your own right now. And so don't just take out loans so that you can live a comfortable lifestyle. Maybe you want a new jacket or, you know, want to go to a concert and hear your student so you can take out a loan. Because honestly, like there's going to be strings attached to your loan. And, um, at the end of the day, you should only take out student loans for things like tuition, room and board, and like those required fees and supplies that are associated with your degree. Um, and that's not from the loan, that's just for just general good advice because we wanna minimize our expenses um, because when we pay it back, it might be more than what we took out. Jimmy, can we go back and actually talk about, we don't have another slide on, on scholarships, right? Can we talk about scholarships for a second? Um, yeah. longer because you mentioned that right those you don't pay back so those happen above right apply for those scholarships before you apply for loans can you tell them um or do you want me to tell them about how to find how do you find a scholarship how do you know what you're eligible for um you know what where did where do they start um so i would say that for i'm a student so i've been a student for a while now um some scholarships come from your school so your school might have a list of just different scholarships that they offer based on your background or based on need or also based on um, an effort that you take. So sometimes you can win a scholarship based on writing an essay on a topic that a different organization is really cares about. And so if your essay is selected, you can have money towards your tuition that you don't pay back. It's prize money necessarily that goes towards paying your education. And so Schools might list different scholarships that students have gotten in the past and that are annual so you can apply for them. Um, they could also be based on your grades. So if you come in with really good grades, sometimes schools will give you scholarships. And as long as you maintain a certain average, you'll still be able to be awarded that amount of money. Um, and then there are public scholarships that the school isn't telling you about because you can take that initiative on your own to start looking for them. And so, um, Sherry, if you have different avenues that you know are like credible scholarships, I'll turn it to you. Uh, you know, you know, I think we used to have a list somewhere and I, maybe I'll try to get back to you. I don't know, but I'll have to update it. Um, but really that tends to be from the community a lot of the times. A lot of times um, different organizations that someone is involved with, um, whether it be athletic, religious, community, people just find out. Um, there was one, uh, some are larger organizations. I wanna say Coca-Cola used to have one, uh, a scholarship. Um, uh, First Aid Beauty uh, has one. Uh, so sometimes they're just different organizations that wanna support a population I think the first aid beauty was trying to support women. I think that one was open for women. Um, you know, so you know, there's just different ones that way to find out about. And if you do hear about it, you know, do a, a little research. But most of them are pretty are pretty credible, which is great. And you know, we encourage people to to look for them. You know, do some research. But the school really is the best place to start because uh, they will have a pretty robust list. Most schools have a pretty robust list of what scholarships are available or what students have received in, in the past. 
So I agree that that's a great place to start, Jamie, like you said. Great, and then like we talked about for a second with the credit cards, right? So if you borrow money, you can pay it back when you have the money. So if you realize that like you've borrowed student loans, but you have a part-time job while you're in college and you have some money and you wanna start paying them back before they get interest, you can do that. We're gonna talk about paying loans back, but I just wanted to say that like, you can do whatever you need to minimize your expenses. Um, and so at that point, however much money you take from your loans, most loans you start paying back once you graduate. And then that's when they start accruing that extra interest, meaning you're gonna be paying back more than you took out. Um, so you want that number to be smaller when you graduate. Okay, great. All right, so this is one, Jamie, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt you because this is another one this is one of those pieces of advice that you hear that I don't always agree with, to be honest with you, but it's out there. So I'm putting it out there because I want you all to be informed. So this used to be the advice. Don't take out, take out what you think you're going to be able to make your first year and don't take more than that. So I graduated law school in 09. So I graduated during the Great Recession. And the reason that this is no longer advice is because of, of my graduating class. Because our anticipated income when we all started school completely changed during the Great Recession. By the time we graduated, our anticipated income was much lower because we were graduating during the Great Recession. So even if you took this to be true, there could be factors that are totally out of your control um, that would change this. So no longer do we say do this kind of math. The bottom line is just borrow the least amount that is possible and feasible for you to be successful. That's the bottom line. You know, don't always mess with this math. Yes, if you are going to be in, in a high earning degree, um, you know, maybe you, you are taking that into account, but there, there are just a lot of variable factors there that you may or may not have control of. Whereas if you were proactive and just um, borrowed uh, the littlest amount possible, even if that's still kind of a high number, don't get me wrong, folks, that could still be sort of a high number, but still the, the least amount for you to be successful, then you're still going to be better off no matter what you end up doing um, post-graduation. So again, this is still advice. I want people to be aware of the advice that's out there. But when you hear it, you know, you can say, okay, wait, we talked about this and I'm still gonna maximize uh, my other options as much as possible. A and you go from there. Okay, Jamie, I'm turning it back into you about our public and private, so the different types of student loans, and yeah. then I think we're over our hour. So we'll, we'll wrap up after this discussion of the public and private and what order we should be um, applying for these. Okay, so, there are two kinds of student loans. I think Shari just said them. You have public loans and private loans. And so it's to borrow wisely, you really need to understand the difference. Um, and so what we want to encourage you to do is use public or federal loans first, because that's a loan between you and the United States government and not a private institution. Private institutions include banks, they include people. And so the reason that you want to go with the government is because the government is they have an incentive to promote higher education. And if the value of money changes, they might make policies that impact your public loans, right? So there's a lot of talk now about loan forgiveness or what that might mean. And so if the government decides to change the rules on their public loans, then you might end up with, you know, um, a lower bill, right? But COVID whatever was a perfect example of this. Jamie, that um, uh, during the, so uh, the federal loans have been paused. So during COVID, right, just like you were saying, they made a policy and people haven't paid or haven't needed to pay their public loans um, this entire time. They're, they're not starting again until January where that wasn't true for the private loans. So that's an example of a policy, like you just said, um, where the, the benefit was with the federal loan. Right, and so private loans don't have those same incentives to really work with you. And so those, those loans aren't gonna be as affected by government changes. And so if you can borrow from the government as opposed to from a private lender, that's your best bet. Okay, 
And so loan documents are pretty dense. It's kind of the same thing as like signing a contract. And that means that you really shouldn't sign on the dotted line until you understand what you're signing. Um, and so some of the things that are included um, when you sign for a loan are, you know, how are you going to get the money? When are they going to process your fees? Do they need somebody else to sign the loan as well as you? Um, how much money are you going to have to pay back? Is it just the amount that you borrowed or is it going to be an interest rate? And when does that interest rate accrue? How much is that in interest rate? And then how fast do you actually need to pay back this money? Because again, like this day that you graduate, is it all due? Or is there going to be a timeline? Is there a plan? And you just want to know those details before you take their money. Um, and so you're allowed to ask questions. It's really okay. You can say like, what is the interest rate? It's not written there. Um, Cause you want to show that you're informed that, um, that you really understand the process and that you, uh, you know who you're dealing with. And so, yes, it's important to also know like what questions to ask. Cause sometimes you just aren't aware of like what you should be looking out for. So like we said before, you want to know how much money to pay back. So that means ask what the interest rate is, ask when that accrues, um, ask how you repay the loan or how often you need to make payments um, and how much those payments need to be. Because remember, we talked about a minimum and paying in full. And so sometimes you have to pay a minimum at a certain time um, within your repayment period. Um, and so here's our little like oversimplification of what the difference between public. We say over, it's actually a pretty dense slide for our oversimplification, believe it or not. But you know, student loans are complex. So at least this is a one page that you can reference um, for the info. Um, so just to give you the highlights, right? Like what are public loans? What are private loans? And so public loans generally offer you low fees and fixed interest rates. And they're set up as programs for low-income students. Um, they allow you to reduce or stop payments if you go back to school or if you're experiencing a qualified financial hardship. Um, they'll let you combine multiple loans into a single payment plan. And they might forgive some of your debt if you do certain types of public service um, or if you perfect your payment history. Um, and so public loans, like we said, those are from the government. And so you generally have to fill out government forms to qualify for them. So that some of you might have heard of the FAFSA. That's what we're talking about to a certain extent. Um, private loans. So remember, that's like banks or from private institutions. And so there you might need to have a co-signer who, if you can't pay back, they're going to have to take on that responsibility for you. Um, they do require fixed payments and they don't usually care what your circumstances are and they'll have like shorter triggers for when you miss a payment or default um, and they could also charge you penalties um, sooner than you're you might expect so it's just important to keep that in mind what the benefits of public versus private loans could be um, and the reason you might take a private loan is because maybe your public loan didn't Cover everything. So we're not saying don't take private loans. We're saying try to not take them if you could find other avenues. Right, Cherry? Yeah, yeah. And just and just to, and apply for the public first. So again, it's an order, right? You're trying to save money. You still need some. Get the scholarships first. Okay, I still need some loans. Okay, apply for public. I still need a little extra. Then private. Like there's a priority setting when you are looking at these loans in which order you should. Um, as far as which are going to give you the most benefits and lowest interest rates, or in the case of scholarship, not even have to pay back at all. So it, it's really the priority setting and order that we want to highlight here. Right. And what you need to understand is that loans are you borrowing someone else's money. So you're borrowing the government's money, you're borrowing an institution's money, and they've given it to you. So even if you don't fulfill your end of the bargain, like by finishing your degree, or, you know, you didn't reach your expectations of getting the job you thought you would get, you still took the money. So you still have to pay the money back, even if you didn't complete your degree or finish school because you took the money. Um, and so some people think that, you know, maybe I don't have that money anymore. I spent it on school and I don't have any other money. So I'm going to file for personal bankruptcy 
The bankruptcy code has a lot of provisions that prevent you from discharging student loans. So even if you go into bankruptcy and don't have to pay any of your other bills, the student loans are more likely to stick with you unless you can show real duress that you'll like never ever in your whole life like make this money back or that they should have never even invested in you to begin with and like no one should have given you a loan. But that's really hard and about 1% of people um, have their student loans eliminated in bankruptcy. Um, so like Sherry said, there is talk now of different forgiveness for loans, but that's not the same thing as elimination. And so if you take money from somebody, the general principle is that you're going to have to pay that money back. Okay. All right. So to wrap up, guys, let's see, we've, we've gone over time, so we want to wrap up, but the concepts that we are uh, pushing here are the same. Start with budgeting. Know where, where your money is coming from, where it's going. When you use credit, go into it with your eyes open and knowledgeable. Same with student loans. Know what you're signing. Know the priorities and the order in which you should be looking at loans in order to maximize what you take out. And again, don't be afraid to ask along the way. Um, check, do your research. Um, check with the financial folks at uh, JFCS, call us at CBAP. You know, there's, there's ways to get that information and just make sure you're going to anything when it comes to your finances with your eyes open um, and having done your research so that you are the most empowered and knowledgeable about uh, your personal finances. And that's really where you're gonna be in the best position. Um, so thank you. Are there any other final questions that we have before we wrap up? We threw a lot of info at you. Um, and so you should have our information or your, our website. Hopefully Deborah can put on the CBAP website in the chat and you can find us if you have any follow-up questions or if you email uh, the group and those questions get to us, we can follow up that way as well. Um, but just wanted to thank you for listening and for um, having us and letting us talk with you all today. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. I know we went a little bit over time, so hopefully you all were able to stick around and hear all this great information. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, but like I said before, you can email me if you think of something tomorrow and I'll make sure Sherry and Jamie get notified and we'll get an answer back to you. <laughs>